Yeah, it's so appropriate that we're using Jimmy to roll these episodes out. When you think about his iconic performance at Woodstock in 1969, uh, Summer of Love, and it's the summer again. But this year, Summer of Reruns. That's right. It's the Summer of Reruns at the Unified CXM Experience. And as always, I'm your host, Grad Khan, CXO or Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler, a New York Stock Exchange listed company, ticker symbol CXM. All right, so uh, this is another rerun show, and today we're talking about the Marketing Profs webinar, uh, how the world's greatest brands do mass one-on-one. Uh, I really love this one, actually. It was one of my um, sort of favorite experiences over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, I had a really great discussion with Valerie Witt. Uh, we talked a lot about where brands were going, uh, how the world's greatest brands are doing one-to-one marketing, what mass one-on-one marketing is. If you had a chance to listen to anything I've ever done, you should hopefully know what mass one-on-one is by now. And if you don't, that's okay, because you can listen right now and hear all about mass one-on-one marketing. Uh, the other thing that was great about this particular webinar is I also built it out into some examples. And I'm playing a little bit with this uh, idea of mass one-to-one moments and looking at uh, you know, marketing against people's moments in their lives, which they typically broadcast. And so this is sometimes called life stage marketing. That's an old term, actually. It's been around a long time. We talked about life stage marketing at Procter & Gamble in the 80s, so it's not exactly brand new. But life stages are being broadcast in a way like they've never been broadcast before. And very few companies, almost no companies, are taking advantage of, which is mind-blowing to me. If we had had the access to life stage data that we have today, back in the 80s when I was running this for brands like Cascade and Tide and others, we would have been all over it. So I don't know what's going on, but I think maybe people have forgotten about the motion or maybe they're just lazy. I don't know. Maybe it could be possibly. Anyway, so enjoy this Marketing Profs webinar uh, with Valerie Witt, and I'll be back at the very end to clean it up. By the way, I will be referencing a bunch of different slides through this. So if you're listening to the podcast, Great, no problem. If you want to see what the slides were and check it out later, they're in the podcast notes and posted also uh, on any blog post about this. So uh, enjoy. All right, everyone, you're here for how the world's greatest brands do mass one-to-one marketing. Grad, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. uh, So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to go through a general presentation today. I'll spend about 45 minutes on this. Um, If I end a few minutes early, I think that'll be okay because generally this generates a fair number of questions. So I'm going to try to leave as much time for questions as I can at the end. Um, But I do want to land a few concepts and particularly around mindset. I think that mindset is one of the most challenging things for us to change. And as marketers, we're being confronted with sort of new mindset issues all the time. And uh, getting our heads wrapped around this stuff is really tricky. Uh, So I'm going to go into that and uh, sort of buckle up a little bit as I sort of take us on a little marketing journey. Um, I've got sort of three what I'll call modern truths that I want to land. So uh, the worldview we have at Sprinkler has these three modern truths. And the first of these modern truths is that we are transitioning to a new marketing paradigm broadly and globally. Uh, It's called conversational marketing. You've probably heard that term used. And it's also known as mass one-to-one, which you may not be as familiar with, but I'm going to talk a lot about mass one-to-one over the next little while. So a quick history lesson, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but uh, let's go way back in the time machine to the 19th century. Um, Back then, people had great, intimate, one-to-one conversations with their customers. Everybody knew everybody, you know, a brand to customer communication was two-way. It was fantastic. And then mass communication came around. Mass communication launched the broadcast age of marketing and broadcast marketing was pretty amazing. We, we created some great brands over that period of time uh, and things like, you know, television, radio, movie theaters, and all that stuff allowed us to reach millions of people really quickly. And it was a cost. You know, if you read authors uh, at the early part of the 20th century, people like uh, Claude Hopkins or Albert Lasker, if they talk about the loss of 
intimacy, the loss of connection, um, the loss of humanity in the new broadcast medium. And if you actually read a lot of the early print ads, there's a great book by Julie, Julian Lewis Watkins called The World's 100, World's 100 Greatest Advertisements. And it's a bunch of print ads from the late 1800s through uh, the 1950s. And if you read some of these like early, early um, ads, they're, they're oddly intimate, oddly intimate and very personal. And what they were trying to do is they're trying to connect with people and try to maintain that connection and intimacy. But then, you know, TV came along and became ascendant. Bill Bernbach and the creative revolution in the 1960s came along. And then we were just really looking at images and very sort of simple ways of communicating a brand. Again, not a bad thing necessarily, but the intimacy was, was lost. And now to a certain extent, my dad was a madman. He worked on Madison Avenue in the 70s and you know, had, you know, had uh, connections with and worked with some of the giants of the industry like George Gribben and... Um, uh, Mr. Wonderman and people like that. It was, it was pretty amazing, actually. But I was always jealous of him. It always felt like, you know, he got, you know, all the good times, right? <laughs> maybe too many good times sometimes, uh, but he got all the good times. And I kind of walked into marketing when it got boring. Uh, but then 21st century came along. And I actually think this is the best time to be in marketing. I tell this to everybody. Uh, I think if you are a student of marketing and you love marketing, this is an amazing time to be in this profession because the one-to-one -one is back. We now know people and we know their interests and we still have mass. Uh, 4.1 billion people are on social platforms. And so this combination of one-to-one -one and mass is a mass one-to-one. -one. And I, I'm not going to take credit for the term. It was actually coined by Mark Pritchard, who is the chief brand officer at Procter & Gamble. I worked there actually at the beginning of my career for the first first nine years. And uh, P&G is also a great sprinkler customer talking, are doing some amazing things to move from a mass blast, as Mark calls it, to mass one-to-one -one precision. And it's uh, very exciting to see them do that, along with some of the world's biggest companies are moving to this sort of type of approach. And I'll we'll talk some examples of that as well. So let me go through um, well, six different examples of mass one-to-one -one in action. And these are all large brands and some of the greatest brands in the world. And the first example I'll use is McDonald's. So McDonald's had for many years used focus groups as a way to determine new menu items and then they would test them in stores. And the, the challenge they're having with focus groups is that people were, you know, I've, I've never loved focus groups. I always sort of jokingly say they're a way to pay people to lie to you, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so they had um, focus groups are getting increasingly complicated because people were badging themselves with food. And so they would sit down in front of others and they would say McDonald's should sell more salads and more healthy alternatives and all this other kind of stuff. And so they would you know, dutifully try that out and no one would buy it. And so they said, why don't we take a different approach? And they became a sprinkler customer and they said, what are people actually asking for when they're publicly expressing love or desire for McDonald's? And it turns out people really wanted to have McDonald's breakfast items at different times of the day. You know, it's the afternoon. I really feel like pancakes, I'm super hungover. I really need an Egg McMuffin right now at midnight. Uh, or I really would love to have a hash browns with my Big Mac for lunch today. And so they used that to determine which items they were going to sell. Uh, and they launched all day breakfast. But what they did, and this is a great example of mass one-to-one, -one, is the way they launched it is they went back to those people who had said, I want pancakes in the afternoon. And we go back in time five years. So you've got a kind of a running five-year view of the modern web and sprinkler. Uh, and so sometimes it'd be like, hey, you know, from November 2018 or something. So they would be, hey, grad, uh, and on November 2018, you said you wanted pancakes. Well, now we have them. It blew people's minds, partly because they were being listened to, partly because they're being responded to and partly because they had actually done the thing that they asked for. So everybody just like heads exploding, started talking about it, retweeting it, became a top trending topic on Twitter, got picked up by the mainline media to tend to look at that. And then the launch just exploded from there and has generated billions of dollars in revenue from McDonald's. So great example of mass one-to-one -one advertising and marketing. Um, care is another area where, you know, you think about it, your best, your customers are the people calling your care lines and your best prospects for the future customers are your existing customers. And Dell understands this really well. And they have, you know, tons and tons of uh, mentions out there you know, like tens of millions of mentions. And so they actually use Sprinkler to proactively predict and solve problems. And what they found is you can actually 
see a problem, like say fan noise or screen flicker or something like that, will start to crop up in the social platforms and in the discussion groups and Reddit and places like that, uh, in the blogs, uh, in you know review sites. They'll start, that'll start to appear two to three weeks before returns begin and before people start calling the main customer care lines. And so they can actually get in front of these problems and fix them in advance uh, and also reach out and solve problems for people on modern channels where they prefer to be. And so they're seeing an improvement in both customer sat and obviously a reduction in cost because they're doing it in asynchronous channels. Um, Disney actually has done some cool stuff with their launch. Uh, so again, this you could argue this is not exactly one-to-one, -one, but they created 115,000 different versions of their advertising to be able to show people that no matter who they were and what kind of interest they have, there was something for them on the Disney Plus channel. And they hit their five-year subscription goal in one year. Most people have seen the results. Disney Plus has been really successful, but they use this you could call this potentially one to few, but still, you know, who's done 115,000 different pieces of creative? Now, we're seeing this regularly happen at Sprinkler all the time. Usually, it's 10 to 20,000. We have had customers do up to 8 million pieces. When one customer do 8 million different creative ad units in the space of about 100 days, and it was an incredibly successful campaign as well. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a really old company called Rust-Oleum, and they make paint. In fact, they make the paint that the Golden Gate Bridge is painted with. So that little basket that goes back and forth. And once it gets to one end of the bridge, they you know, paint the bridge all over again. It just goes back and forth continuously. Um, so Rust-Oleum, that's what they do. Now, they have a lot of really interesting paints, uh, things like tub and tile paint or glitter paint and sparkle paint and all sorts of stuff that you know just generally people don't even a know they exist or b expect them to exist and so what they do is they'll go say with sparkle paint they'll go to pinterest boards and find people who like sparkle and say there's sparkle paint and they sell a lot of sparkle paint that way uh, or they'll look at people who are talking about doing a renovation or bought a new house and they'll say there's tub and tile paint if you want to change the color of your tiles, the color of your tub without ripping it out. And they sell a lot of tub and tile paint that way. In fact, they do this for more than 60 different products and it's been an incredible motion for them to be able to essentially go one-to-one -to, -one to the people who need their product. And obviously they can't do that on TV. They can't do it in mass media. Uh, Siemens, very interesting company, you know, large uh, German conglomerate, and they produce thousands of pieces of content every month uh, with you know hundreds of thousands of assets and lots of different workflows. And what they're what they wanted to do is they wanted to actually improve the quality of the creative that they are issuing and reduce the cost. And they found they were producing tons and tons of content that was uh, unmeasured and uncoordinated, and they didn't know how to make the best of it. And so what they've done is they've concentrated everything into Sprinkler. And then what they do is they then use that to take the stuff that works best and expand that on a global basis. And it's been very successful. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about Dyson, uh, which is you know how to de you know, deliver um, products on platforms. And there's a new thing called conversational commerce. And in uh, Messenger, you can actually have a flow where you can buy a product right within the flow. And then you have an agent connected to it and the agent can handle multiple buyers at the same time. And bots are used as well to mediate some of the exchange. And now you've got sort of the convenience of online and the high touch of a retail store. And it's a great combination. And we're seeing a massive move to this across our whole customer base. So that's just a bunch of different examples of mass one-to-one. -one. And I think conversational commerce for me is maybe the ultimate expression of it because it's not just mass one-to-one -one advertising, but it's actually mass one-to-one -one selling. So um, second truth, a true customer profile needs to include both transactional and experienced data. I'll talk about what I mean by that. So many of us, or most of us, I would say, have got pretty good transactional databases uh, in CRM systems in you know, excellent products like Salesforce uh, and others. Uh, Microsoft has got Dynamics and there's a bunch of things out there. Um, this is structured data. Um, and it's generally solicited. It might be survey data, but it's generally solicited and very highly structured uh, and works inside the relational database systems of all these CRM systems. But now there's this whole new world of information out there, which we call experience data. And this experience data is unstructured, it's unsolicited. It comes in a lot of different types. 
It can be emojis. It can be videos. It can be memes. It can be images. It's a lot of stuff. Very hard to fit that into a relational database. So you need to bring these two things together. And one way I like to describe it is that the transactional data is sort of like your pool. You know, it's, you know, it's temperature controlled. You know what the salinity is. You know, it's clean. It's beautiful. Uh, and then the experience data is like the ocean. Also very cool, but just you need different tools for it, and you're never going to really completely control it. And so together, these things create a 360-degree customer profile. Um, many people uh, use um, Sprinkler as a CDP, and the CXM profiles are in there with both types of data integrated. This is a good friend of ours, Bev Jackson, who's a VP of Twitter, and, and she, you know, she talks about social as being a way of allowing brands to create one-on-one -on -one relationships. You'll see this word one-on-one -on -one keep keep cropping up. And, uh, and Bev has been a leader in this space for many, many years. So the uh, last thing, uh, sort of the last modern truth is that customer expectations have changed. And this is not going to be super surprising to anyone on this call, but it's worthwhile just touching on some of the changes that have occurred just to, just to magnify the amplitude of it. So the first thing is there are as I said, 4.1 billion social users on the planet, which is a pretty good percentage of the 4.7 billion internet users, which is, by the way, incredibly exciting. Like we are getting super close to getting everyone online. It's just, we got to get the last 2 billion online, but that is really a really amazing progress. Uh, so that's the world we live in today. Um, and they prefer increasingly to be on modern channels. This is from a Mary Meeker deck. If you follow Mary Meeker, this is from a couple of years ago. If you don't follow Mary Meeker, uh, you should follow Mary Meeker. It's really, it's really awesome stuff that she does. And um, so this is um, uh, this chart. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that folks in the older generation actually really like synchronous connections to brands, uh, and they like the phone. Uh, and so, great. And so we still use a lot of phone service, especially in customer care departments. But look at the generations as they get younger. I mean, even Generation X isn't, isn't a slacker here, but particularly Generation uh, Z and Generation Y, strong preference for social and strong preference for chat and on the web. And these are all asynchronous communication types. Now, this is two years ago, and there's been some, you know, some stuff's happened in the last couple of years that has accelerated this unquestionably. As we spend all day long on Zoom calls, uh, it's becoming impossible to say, I've got to go call a customer service department for an hour. Can't do it. I'm going to need to do that asynchronously. So this is becoming more important than ever as people migrate to these, what we call modern channels. And you think about this, they're on these channels. There's billions of conversations every day. There's like 65 billion messages sent every day on the planet, which is incredible. Uh, you've got to listen to it. And I would say at a minimum, all brands should be listening to people who are talking to them or you know, using an, an app mention or a hashtag. Um, many brands still aren't, but, but I'd say most brands get that they should be doing this. Um, we also recommend that you should really also be listening to people who are talking about you without app mentioning you. Because uh, actually increasingly, customers are getting used to good listening protocols by companies. And so they're not actually putting at symbols in front anymore. So if you're going to capture, capture everything, you've got to listen to a broad scale of customers. Now, what really gets interesting, when you start listening to your competitors, what people are saying about them. And then finally, what's really interesting is to listen to the category. So for example, it's you know fascinating to listen to someone addressing you directly, say uh, at, at Nike. Um, it's good to find everyone who's talking about Nike. It's really interesting to hear about Adidas and to hear about uh, other brands. But boy, wouldn't it be great to talk about marathons? It's the people talking about the sports, and that's the conversation that you want to be part of if you're going to do true mass one-to-one -one marketing. So, um, you know, one thing about the world today is that, you know, we've got identity and interest from people. And so, you know, these identity and interests are translate to a customer who knows that we know these things about them. Uh, so customers have got a sort of set of things. I'm not going to go through every one of them here because you can read them, but they really kind of want you to find them and resolve their issues and you should be personalized and you know hey you you as a company you're going to need to like win me on this stuff and i do feel like a lot of times you know we we operate very much like uh, the movie 50 first dates it's a few years ago but it's drew barrymore and adam sandler in a movie where drew barrymore has got a particular type of brain injury that um, means that she's got amnesia so every morning when she wakes up she doesn't remember what happened 
at all. She's complete am amnesia. And so Adam Sandler is romancing her and every day he learns more about her, but you know, it's each day is like a new first date. And uh, it was kind of like how marketing sort of works sometimes. <laughs> like you go to a company and you may have spent hundreds or thousands or you know, sometimes even millions of dollars with that company. And they, uh, they don't know that they don't know you. They don't know what you've done with them before. They treat kind of everyone the same. And that is increasingly becoming unacceptable and frustrating to customers because they know that you actually have that data. You just haven't figured out how to access it or how to use it. So don't get into the 51st days problem. I don't know who this guy is, but, uh, um, what I like to say is that, you know, the brand experience right? Like what you're landing with your stakeholders is the brand. And so whatever you think your brand is, whatever you want your brand to be, and whatever brand character statements you've got and strategies and all that kind of stuff, that's great. You should have that. doesn't really matter. The experience you're landing is your brand. And quite frankly, the experience you land gets talked about by others. And um, as you saw in the previous slide, 95% of people will talk about a bad experience. So if you land bad experiences, that'll become your brand. Okay, now there's always one more. So there's one more thing. So I know there's three modern truths on the slide, but I do have one more thing and that this idea of unified. So unified is better than integrated. Let me talk a little bit about this in a more esoteric terms for a second. So generally in most categories and most markets, um, they start off with a set of integrated or best of breed applications. Um, even if you think about the iPhone, right? The iPhone is essentially the story I'm kind of building here. Before the iPhone, we all had notepads and we had calendars and we had the hundreds of things that an iPhone can do all in separate pockets and in separate parts of our desk, et cetera. Um, the iPhone essentially unified all those things into a single platform, which is sort of this evolution that always occurs uh, in any category. So I would say that we've seen it happen in healthcare. You know, Epic Healthcare has basically taking that market over now. Um, they were sort of pitching a unified approach years ago. It finally started making sense as the, um, as, you know, the changes were occurring in the way payment occurs to hospitals and outcomes became really important. And so Epic could show superior outcomes from a unified platform and, and there we go. Um, it's happening all across multiple different categories and it's starting to happen in MarTech as well. Uh, as we look at these MarTech stacks that we've built, that in some cases, you know, people are winning awards for the complexity of their stack. I think the stackies are the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. Um, it's not working. The, the latency is too high. It's too complicated. It's expensive. It's hard to manage that many vendors. And so people are moving to a unified approach. And, and we are uh, at Sprinkler, a, a unified CXM uh, platform. So we are part of that movement. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to unified. Uh, and this is again, general advantages, but you've got a single customer profile. Um, you've got way less attack surface for phishing and for any kind of hacking. Uh, you, you sort of de-risk upgrades because if you've got an integrated stack, one upgrade in one application can bring the whole thing down. And there's you know, many other reasons why uh, people are doing that. So that's another sort of truth that we believe in and is important to us. Now, um, how does this all kind of work? And, and this is kind of a, an interesting little set of um, builds here. So if you think about mass one-to-one, -one, um, I've talked a lot about, I used some examples and talked a lot about you know, having to hear what people are saying and then you know, do something about it. So you really need everything integrated into a single platform so that you can both listen to and react to. And I've divided this into five steps. So I, th I think step one is really gather. You've got to gather from as many places as you can. In Sprinkler's case, we pull from 400 million different data sources and we can combine internal data that you have inside your company uh, with the external data from everything from the social platforms to messaging platforms to blogs, review sites, forums, and all now all TV, all radio, all newspaper, and all magazines. So it's just, everything is in there. Because that's a lot of stuff, you need to be able to sort that. So we've been building a very sophisticated AI platform for, oh, eight, nine years now. And this allows us to be able to sort and identify content in a way that you can react to it and manage it uh, in a timely fashion. 
Um, that leads to this profile that we talked about, this 360 degree profile. Uh, that profile allows you to collaborate. And the collaboration thing is key because if you see what typically happens in most marketing orgs uh, or most orgs in general, is that the silos are where the experience breaks. Uh, it's that breakage between groups that lets the, lets the customer down. And so if you have a single profile, everyone in the company can see what's happened to that customer and they can then react appropriately and behave in a way that the customer feels like they're known and they're seen. And finally, uh, then you need to be able to engage and sell. And we have a variety of different uh, tools and applications built on top of our platform that allow people to engage in social selling or you know, social media management or care or you know, influencer and advocacy marketing and all that kind of stuff. Those are all, these are all the kinds of different things you need to be able to do. But really at the end of the day, what you're building is you know, a system where you've got to go from insight to action. So these are the five steps just kind of end to end. And you've got to be able to know what people are saying, make sense of it, get that in a way that you can react to it, collaborate around it, and then do the kinds of things that people want to do to be able to talk to them. So that's a kind of a nice way to think about how mass one-to-one -one is enabled by a unified CXM system. All right, so I'm going to kind of, um, you know, making a good time here. So I'm going to go into what I'll call mass one-to-one -one moments. And I've been on this, I've been on this hobby horse for a while now. And I'm a little confused as to why more people aren't doing this. There are a bunch that are, which is great. But this seems like the most obvious thing marketers could do. And it is practiced way too infrequently. So I'll go into that and show you what I mean. So moments. So humans broadcast their life moments. They just want to celebrate and they want to connect with others who they have a shared experience with. And if you think about this networked world we live in and how it works, it's actually amazing. Uh, if, you, if you remember my sort of three column diagram where I talked about the 19th, 20th and 21st century, what's interesting about the 21st century is people are not just connected to brands now, but they're also connected to each other. And when you're connected to another person, you wanna tell them about the things that have happened to you. So in this networked world we live in, the core of it, and the kind of the key conversations that are happening are conversations around life moments. They may be small moments. You know, I had an ice cream today. And they may be big moments. You know, I graduated today, but they are moments. Uh, Forrester's got a great study on what they call life stage and life cycle marketing. Uh, they've got this nice kind of way of thinking about it. Uh, it's a diagram of intensity from a data standpoint on the y-axis and then customer intimacy on the x-axis. And so mass marketing, not surprisingly, low intimacy, low data intensity. Not that mass marketing is bad. This is not, this is not a judgment diagram, but it's just that's kind of how it sits. Uh, and you need mass marketing, but you also need to do other things. So many people are now doing event-triggered marketing. Marketing automation and the popularity of tools like Marketo has driven that. So that's, I think, getting more common and it's based on actions you take on a website or other things like that. So, you know, event triggered is, is getting more common. What is not nearly as common as I think it should be is life stage marketing. And this is the moments I was talking about when something happens, why not celebrate with that person? Why not talk to them? And what is very rare is life cycle marketing which is once someone is inside your franchise, you then watch what's happening to them, watch what's happening in their life, and then be able to recommend new products to them as their life changes. Uh, what um, insurance would be a great example, right? So if you're an insurance company, you've got a customer, right now, when I have a change in my life, I have to call my insurance company to get things changed. Wouldn't it be amazing? Like, wouldn't it be something else? If instead of me having to call them, they called me and said, Hey, grad, I see you just got engaged. Are you going to need some new kinds of insurance or congratulations on your wedding? These are both true things for me in the near future. Congratulations on your wedding. You know, here's how to think about your insurance portfolio now. Or, hey, we saw you just bought a new car. This is like how you can save money with our car insurance premiums. Like, there's no reason why they, people can't do this right now with their existing customers. Um, but because they haven't built those CXM profiles, um, they don't get around to it. So that's sort of the model in Forrester. Uh, one thing I think I would note is that there are many life paths. Sometimes people try to duke this out and sort of fake it a bit with demographics, but be very careful with that. Demographics 
can be correct in the aggregate, but inevitably wrong at the personal level. It's sort of like um, if you look at a, an ant colony, you can generally predict the motion of the whole ant colony, but it's very, it's impossible to predict the action of a single ant. And the problem is we need to know the action of a single ant in order to sell to somebody. And so um, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, there's no demographic that would show that I'm someone who would be, you know, a newlywed in the near future, right? Um, but I will be. And so, and I've gotten, by the way, zero marketing based on that fact. Um, zero marketing when I announced I was engaged. It's crazy. And all sorts of changes are occurring in my life that would be very similar to the changes that occur to anyone who becomes newlywed. And so um, marketers need to get more thoughtful about going after what people are broadcasting, and what people are saying, not trying to go after gross level demographics, which is very much a mass marketing type of thinking. I'll give you a few just examples because sometimes people go, well, you know, do people really talk about this stuff? Yeah, they do. You know, this is just this in the last week. These are like people talking about real estate, you know, having trouble buying a house. There's 600,000 life updates. And, you know, maybe every single person on the planet isn't doing a life update this week, but a lot are. And I would say as a marketer, like get to those first 600,000 and then, you know, you can kind of start taking care of the rest of them after that. Um, I'll give you some examples. This is for cars. So this last week, uh, people more than 14,000 times said they're actually buying a car. I mean, very deliberately, I am buying a car, right? Not I did buy, buy, I am buying. Um, it's shocking how little marketing is going against these people. Like there's nothing. Um, even the car companies who are actually in the business of selling cars don't say anything, but certainly you'd want to see more loan and insurance and all that kind of stuff. Um, and here's an example of what that could look like. Uh, so here's an actual post. This is someone named Coda um, from June 19th. So recently uh, he's thinking about buying a car and, you know, I'm going to do something. And what you could do is you could respond to them. And here's, here's a sample response from Capital One. Hey, you know, we're here for you, Coda. And of course that's the, um, the Uber station wagon from vacation, uh, the ultimate family wagon. Uh, but there's no reason Capital One can't do this kind of thing and sort of market against that. Um, let's talk about new jobs and promotions that generally generates all sorts of things, new houses, you know, new cars, uh, jewelry, rewards, et cetera. People like to treat themselves well. 30,000 mentions of new jobs uh, in the last week. Uh, so, um, and then, you know, relocating is another one. People are moving and going different places. Almost 30,000 mentions of relocating as well. Here's a couple are changing their life around a little bit, moving to a new city. Um, you know, nationwide could sort of welcome them to the neighborhood, right? Why not get out there and connect with them? Um, they're actually talking about it. Um, people have, a, there's a lot of talk about babies. It's amazing, actually. It's like 10x, uh, our very first category on babies. Uh, nearly 150,000 mentions in the last week. And of course, that creates all sorts of interesting buying and selling opportunities. And so, you know, here's an example. This is actually kind of cool. This is using the image search inside Sprinkler because you'll notice there's not really a lot of mention of baby in here. So we're picking up the emoji and we're picking up the image um, because it was it's sort of nuanced that this is actually uh, an announcement. Um, but then, you know, why couldn't a real estate firm say, hey, you know, you're going to probably need another room. So uh, Engel and Volkers, of course, being a great real estate firm and, and a great customer. So these are all examples of where moments can be marketed against and scaled against. I'll sort of end with uh, some examples from my, my own past. And so um, this is from Microsoft, obviously, Xbox and Office. And, and what we did with these is we actually took these and uh, these are responses to comments that people actually made. And a couple of things I'll just point out here. There's, um, one is you'll notice that the handle is built right into the ad, right? So, you know, Arc Jesse and Bells 4, like that's built right into the ad. The second thing is that you can see their, their responses. So they don't make a ton of sense because you don't see the original post. So they are responding in line to something someone said. And the third thing, and this is the thing that's most surprising to people, um, these are really pictures of the people. They're posterized, but the gentleman with the beard, for example, would recognize himself in that picture. He'd be like, oh my God, that's me. Uh, these are the people. That's the person's dinosaur suit. You know, this is the couple. This is the people getting married. Like these are 
actually the people uh, from their profile photos that are having these conversations with Xbox and Office. Uh, and, and what's amazing is when you do something like this, uh, when we did like thousands and hundreds of thousands of these, uh, when you do something like this, it, it changes people's emotional connection to the brand. And I actually think what's going on, I have thought about this a lot over the years, because it was, it was shocking to me how much, how positively, we never had a negative comment, and how positively people reacted. I think that there's this concept of a digital good. If you're familiar with Line in Japan, they do a great job on this. And, and so there's, these are essentially a type of digital good, because it's creative about you. And uh, it recognizes you and sort of celebrates you. And so there's value in this digital good that's created for the potential customer or prospect. So what that does is it creates a sense of reciprocity between the target and the brand, uh, which is you've given me something of value without me asking for it. Um, wow. Uh, I'm going to you know, reciprocate with like, affection or love or gratitude, 98.5% of the time uh, retweeted, right? They, these get retweeted. And what is super cool is that, as we, I think, mostly know, organic has essentially dried up as a channel. Your followers are unimportant, right? So you, you can't really get to your followers anymore without paid. But this is an interesting hack on that because you essentially get organic amplification. And some of these have gone to generate millions and in one case 63 million views uh, for Microsoft. So really, really, really interesting tactic. Uh, not enough people are doing this and I've shown you a bunch of different examples. Uh, but we are moving to a world where this will be the what everyone does one day. And so I think the brands that get there first will drive some element of competitive advantage. It does require changes in your systems. You got to think differently about content. You got to think differently about your agencies, how you brief stuff. Uh, you can think differently about conversations. And I'm going to end with one story about conversations that I think will be potentially hair raising, but I, I love this story. And, uh, and it'll, it just makes you operate in a completely different fashion. You know, at Microsoft, we had to organize ourselves into customer experience centers and, you know, kind of pot it up and make sure that people were sort of sharing and moving quickly. Um, and you do have to take some risks. You know, I, th I think this is the part where maybe people get a little uncomfortable, but it's in that discomfort that you may find innovation because we got very used to over the course of the broadcast era, we got very used to being offensive to no one, I guess would probably be the way to put it. Right. And sort of, uh, but not poten potentially that compelling to anybody, but de definitely not offensive to anyone. And the result of that is this sort of tapioca, like I'm not, you know, I'm not anti tapioca or anything, but just tapioca like approach to marketing doesn't have a lot of impact and doesn't work very well in conversation marketing. It'd be like, you know, going to a party and meeting somebody and saying, Hey, how are you doing? And they're like, I'm fine. And like, oh, okay. You know, it's just like, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time with this person because there's nothing there. They're not willing to say anything or do anything in an interesting way. So uh, there's one more Xbox example, and I'll just do this verbally because it's not really anything to show. So Xbox, um, I got a, a, I got a user complaining and the user was complaining that the first person shooter that they were part of, um, they'd lost their squad. So the, the friends that they'd been playing with, um, had disappeared. And so they, they didn't have a squad anymore. And it's very hard to play these first person shooter games without a squad you know, call of duty. I think was the game. And so he was sort of complaining. That it was kind of hard to find a new squad on Xbox. And he was, yeah, kind of complaining in a slightly edgy way, you know, but gamers are a bit like that. And Xbox sort of uses that. So Xbox responded super helpfully and gave him some suggestions on what he could do. And his response was very negative and kind of you know, sort of slammed Xbox. And it was really unpleasant response, like a really unpleasant response and inappropriate and not called for because Xbox was just trying to be helpful. And there's a person that's doing these things. You don't need to talk to people that way. Anyway, so that's what he did. And so Xbox had a choice. Uh, they could A, not respond at all. It's legit. Uh, and then just gets pushed to the bottom of the pile. B, respond helpfully again, which like nothing wrong with that. And I think there's a legitimate case to be made there. Or C, what they did do. And what they did do is they said, ah, now we see why you don't have any friends. <laughs> which is 
I just love that so much. It got on Reddit. Thousands of people weighed in on this. Not everybody thought it was great. Most people did, but not everybody. And it was you know, a little bit polarizing and a bit negative for some folks, but it created a strength in the brand voice and it created conversation and it created amplification. It was a brave and wonderful moment. And they've gone on to do a lot more stuff like that. And they've got a great voice on the brand now. So uh, that is it for the formal presentation. We got lots of time for questions. So I want to thank you. I do have um, lots of ways to be connected to. So I'm the only grad con in the world. So I'm easy to find. Uh, I do do a daily podcast, uh, which somehow I fit into the day called the Unified CXM Experience. A lot of fun. We talk about different things. Uh, woe befall the company that gives me a bad experience because they end up being featured. Right now, I'm, I'm going downtown on Rooms to Go. Um, they get featured on the podcast uh, liberally. Uh, but feel free to DM me on Twitter or kind of come at me any other way you'd like. Um, happy to talk to you. I uh, particularly love connecting on LinkedIn. And, um, uh, and you can also read my blog uh, where I talk about a lot of these things as well. And that's it for, uh, for today in the formal presentation. Let's kind of head back to questions. Fantastic, Brad. Thank you, for, thank you so much for that presentation. Lots of fun information there. Everyone in the audience, now is the time to ask the question that you've got on your mind. You do that by pressing that Q&A button down in the bottom of your screen. So let's go ahead and just jump right in, Grad. So to kick us off, in many ways, we're going back to the one-to-one -one approach of marketing, like you talked about in the beginning here, but at scale. So why are so many brands and CMOs struggling with something that should be kind of familiar? Well, I don't think it is familiar. And this is like, as I was, I was trying to set this up at the beginning, this is a, this is a huge mindset shift. You know, unless you're like 20 and there aren't that many CMOs that are 20, uh, you've been trained as a broadcast marketer. And, you, 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 and you've lived in a broadcast world for a long time. To shift your mindset from broadcast to conversation is extremely difficult. And I'll, I'll give you a little story on the, kind of the way I sort of think about it. I find it quite helpful. So um, imagine, uh, I'll just, let, me, let me say it in a slightly different way. So um, my favorite communicators are comedians. I love the way comedians communicate. Now, if you think about what comedians do, it's, it's, it's quite different from what brands do. So um, the interesting thing about comedians is that all comedians have the same creative brief, or at least the same benefit statement, right? Uh, so if you think about what the benefit for a comedian would be, it would be, you know, typically the way you write a benefit statement is just to convince the audience that blank, right? that tide cleans the tough stains, like, you know, whatever the, so a comedian would be to convince the audience, right? Anyone guess? Think about it for a second. To convince the audience that I'm funny. Every comedian has the exact same benefit line. Now the reason why and their brand character are often quite different, but their benefit statement is identical. Now, if a marketer took that creative brief and attempted to execute it, the marketer would look at that and say, ah, convince the audience that I am funny. So they walk onto the stage and they would say, okay, I know that repetition works. So I'm just going to start saying it, man. I am funny. 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 And probably seven times, I think, before people remember a message, right? I am funny. I am funny. I think I'm at seven now. And I know, you know, I know that, you know, I got to get good reach going. So I'm, and I know that multimedia work. So I'm going to pan out some pamphlets and maybe have a testimonial from someone in the audience. Yes. Grad's really funny. You know, like, and people will leave that performance and someone will say, Hey, how was, how was the comedy act? And they'll be like, well, you know, I mean, like he said he was funny, like they got the message, right? but they don't believe it. <laughs> right. They don't believe the fact that they're like, he said he was funny, but he's not really so funny. What does a comedian actually do, right? Comedian goes on stage and the comedian sends out a stimulus. So she'll tell a joke. As you hear the joke, you react to it. Not always, but often you'll laugh. And while you're laughing, sometimes laughing very hard, but while you're laughing, you think to yourself, right? You conclude, wow, she's really funny. 
And when you get asked later on, someone says, how was the act? She's like, she was hilarious. I couldn't stop laughing. But remember, but so the funny thing is that people say like, well, what were the jokes? Like people always say, well, what, what was she talking about? What were the jokes? And you know, you can never remember, right? Like, I don't know. There was like, uh, there was like a mother-in-law, an octopus, and like, but you can't like kind of put it together, right? And so what you do is you say, I, she was just hilarious. You remember how you felt and you remember the conclusion that you drew from it. So this shift for brands is really hard because brands have gotten really comfortable just telling people stuff, right? It's, I'm just going to tell you what to think about me. Conversational marketing and what we're talking about right here requires I send a stimulus that may or may not work. Not everybody thinks every comedian is equally funny. And even comedians who are very famous and very funny and very successful, not everybody thinks they're funny. And so you're going to have some people that aren't going to like respond to the stimulus correctly, but you've got to find that stimulus that gets that conversation going. That is really hard. That is really hard. And so I'm not surprised that CMOs are struggling with this, but you know, we've got to figure it out. Fantastic. So Grad, we have several questions here <clears throat> from the audience about how these principles apply to B2B marketing. Yeah, Are there parallels the you can draw on some examples you might be able to share? Yeah, so actually um, my, my job at Microsoft, I was CMO for Microsoft US. It's a, that's the B2B arm. So it's basically mostly commercial, um, like a $30 billion commercial business. Uh, and so I was using this stuff in that business. And of course at Sprinkler, I do all this every day. And of course, Sprinkler is 100% B2B. Um, the great thing, and the, the thing about B2B is, there's two things about B2B. One is sort of a little bit jokey and a little bit snarky, but I'll, I got to make the comment. And the other one is a little bit of an observation about what you're really selling in B2B. So I don't, I, people kind of get wrapped up in their shoelaces on this B2B, B2C thing. And the thing that's kind of cool about B2B is you're still selling to human beings, right? Like <laughs> the same human being who mm-hmm. buying an Xbox, okay, is also buying a CRM system or is also buying a CDP or is also buying a CXM system. Like the same person, right? They buy paper towels and they buy software. Like in this idea that somehow they're completely different people, we need to talk to them like they're like, you know, robots is really bizarre to me. The thing about B2B is that all B2B products all B2B products are selling the same thing. And they, and they very rarely are the marketers sophisticated enough to understand what they're really selling. They all think they're selling their product and they all talk about their features. They're, 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 they often regress even past where most B2C marketers have moved past that a long time ago, but they've regressed to just speeds and feeds and features. But that's actually not what they're selling. What every B2B marketer is selling is, and it could be, they could be selling they could be like a nail manufacturer. They could be a B2B SaaS like Sprinkler, or they could be, you know, bulldozers, like whatever it is. They're all selling the same thing. Do you have any idea what that would be? They're selling career success. When you make a decision to work with a vendor, you're betting your career. You have two curves, right? Career, how can I advance my career? And what are the chances of me getting fired by making this decision? And the fact that B2B companies miss that emotional connection and miss the ability to get someone to think, I'd love to do business with these people because I think they're going to help me be more successful means that they're not thinking about the problem the right way. And that is perfect for conversational marketing, perfect for connected stuff, perfect for what we're doing in the world we're talking about, networked world. I mean, it's the best for B2B. Do you see the life stage concept also applying? Absolutely. You know, if you think about, you know, the, when someone is talking about changing jobs, you know, often they'll be moving to a new job and, you know, very rarely is someone hired and told don't change anything. Right. (laughs) Especially these days, it's like, get in here and rip this thing down and build a new one. And so it's a great opportunity to go in there. And so you can actually do really, really precise account-based marketing and go, go after everyone who's changing jobs. Um, you know, that's you know, within the target audience that you're going after. So you're selling to marketers, for example, uh, you can go after all of them, talk to all of them, you know, be connected to them in a way that they look at you as a friend and somebody who's supporting them. One thing we do at Sprinkler, when anyone in our sort of circle of buying committees gets promoted, we congratulate them. And we send them a little piece of creative, just like I showed you in Xbox, mm-hmm. showing them like moving to their new company and Usually it's like they're kind of like a bobblehead version of them, you know, sort of, there was one person, she was moving to Lyft, you know, we put her in a Lyft car and <laughs> driving over to Lyft, 
People love that kind of stuff. They frame it, they make it their profile photo, they retweet it, they send it to their friends. The next time we have a conversation with that person, you know, what kind of conversation is? It's a great conversation. Our sellers often comment, they'll sit down in a room and it's a warm room because people are like, that was really cool what you guys did. That was really awesome. And, and we're not selling when we do these things. We're often just, just being like human beings, just you know, talking to people, being nice joking around, you know, sort of celebrating their wins, you know, being part of their lives. And then when it comes time to buy something, it's like, you know, we're here to support you. We're here to make this happen. And it's very different way of thinking about selling. Awesome. So Denise is asking about your Microsoft Xbox example with the posterized social media images. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How did you do that? Like how, how does one create a posterized image and how do you do it at scale? Uh, So, well, um, I'm not sure if it's a super duper technical question about how the, uh, the actual art program, which I, I'm not prepared, I'm not, not prepared, I'm not able to answer that because I didn't make yep. them myself. Um, but there, you know, there are tons of programs that posterize images. So it's, that's pretty, that's pretty easy technology. Um, uh, but the key thing is how we organize the team. I think that's probably potentially where the question is going. So, um, we, what we had to do, we played with lots of models. I mean, we, we failed three solid times as we were setting up the CXC, like complete meltdown. Like nobody left, like, you know, total like nuclear annihilation, right? So like <laughs> three solid, you know, kind of terrible r- r- catastrophes. And we finally on the fourth attempt sort of got it right. And we worked with a company called Jeffrey M, who's a great, um, they they fill a lot of the uh, temporary roles at Microsoft, and they're really great at finding really smart young people who are early in career. And so they were they were fantastic partners. We built it up, and we found that what we needed to do is sort of sit. We had we tried one model with which was an agency. We tried another model which was completely in house. Uh, what worked was sitting them kind of in between agency and in house. Uh, and that sort of worked really well. And then we had another agency we, and we tried on the agency front for the content. We went through some of the world's greatest agencies did, couldn't do, couldn't do this because the turnaround is like super fast. They're producing hundreds of pieces of content a day. Uh, so we ended up finding a smaller agency and then hired a bunch of their creatives who actually came in house and sat with the community managers. And so it became a bullpen, right? So community managers go, I got a hot one here. Right. And then just kind of like, in Sprinkler, they would just move it because Sprinkler is a collaboration platform. They would move it to that person. They would look at it. The creatives would come up with an idea, but pretty quickly. They weren't, they weren't trying to like, you know, create the next greatest ad campaign in the world. Just like, I want to respond to this person, posterize it, do the message, and then get it back out again. And if you do that, you can actually produce like shocking amounts of content. So it scales pretty quickly, but it does require like a completely different way of thinking about things. You're obviously not doing creative briefs. Like it's a it's, and you have to put a lot of trust and faith in your people. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to make this an ad for Sprinkler, but I, when I was, you know, at Microsoft, one of the things I really appreciated with Sprinkler is that the governance structure allowed me to gate this stuff. So when someone was new, there was there were multiple levels of approval and I could change those levels at will all the way up to me if I wanted to. Um, and I, I can also bring in other brands and it was a very great way to, in legal, you know, great way to kind of make sure approvals were in place. And then as someone got more experienced and we knew that they knew how to do it, uh, we could sort of push that governance level back down again. And so you could scale, but also scale without risk. Excellent. So next question is, do you have any advice for attempting this type of strategy with disconnected data systems? You talked about how when they're all consolidated, it works best, but what happens if you've got purchasing data in one place, marketing data somewhere else, no API connecting them, um, so merging manually before communications go out? Do you have any advice for how to make it work with that kind of a structure? No. (laughs) Sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I, that I, I, yeah, I don't it, it just, I mean, really complete disconnected systems. I don't know. I don't know how you, you can't do it manually. I mean, I, I, I would, but I, maybe let me try to give a better answer, but the, uh, I was, a, I was momentarily terrified and overwhelmed by that question. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, I think the way to manage that situation is to choose to hero on one thing. Like you just, to try to merge manually or try to even, even merging through APIs is very problematic. Um, very difficult to do correctly. But what you, what you can do is say, well, what do I know that's relevant? 
right? What do I know that's relevant? And let me just do a good job on that. And I will say that there is this, uh, there's this old expression. I don't, I don't know how many people at P&G used it, but I had an ad manager that used it all the time. And he, he ended up becoming CEO. So I think it's probably a pretty good expression. And uh, it's Bob McDonald, this is a Bob McDonald expression. And we used to get stuck in these kind of bizarre academic arguments at P&G because everyone was straight out of school, right? So we, we kind of continued to very much have an academic way of approaching things. And I remember we were on a multi-month argument over um, 15 frames of a Downey commercial. I was a Downey brand manager. Now, 15 frames is, you know, it's half a second. And uh, 15 frames would either add a picture of a mother hugging your child at the end of the ad, or 15 frames could be added to the demo in the middle showing that the bubble didn't break when it hit the towels. And that's what we were arguing over <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> and with, uh, you know, talent, talent, talent cycles work. Um, so the talent cycle had expired. We hadn't renewed. So we were off the air completely. And Snuggle was like, you know, kind of out there, that damn bear, you know, running around being cute and everything. And we weren't, we weren't on the air. And this was going on and we were in this kind of battle royale. And so uh, Bob came in one of these meetings and he kind of like listened to the arguments and we both made our sort of reasoned arguments about why it should be this way. And it was my sort of my boss that I was arguing with. And Bob said two things. He said, well, first of all, he said, the person gets fired in here if they don't make his numbers is grad. So like let him make the decision. And secondly, you know, you've been off the air for two months. You're not going to get on the air instantly. You still got to traffic this thing and everything else. So you're, you're another couple of weeks away from even being on the air. And meanwhile, the snuggle bears, you know, running around beating us up. And he says, I would argue that halitosis is better than no breath at all. I love that expression. Right. And I think sometimes we're so so worried about having it perfect um, that we wait until some great moment, you know, just get out there. You know, like I, you can't get to every single person who's talking about buying a car right away. Okay. We'll get to some of the people that are thinking about buying a car, you know, just like somebody gets out to someone for God's sakes. And then what you'll sort of, you'll figure out how to do more faster as you kind of get that motion going. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, our next question comes from a, an attendee saying, congrats to you and your fiance, and thank, thank you. you for the great presentation. Do you have any suggestions for how a newbie in the pharma industry can develop mm. mass one-to-one -one marketing and where to go for social listening of doctors? Any pointers for where to begin? Yeah, well, that's actually a really interesting question. My brother actually works in biotech and his his wife works in um, at Merck, so kind of in pharma. So I'm sort of familiar with it. Um, and it's a it's challenging industry because of the regulations. So you have to be you have to be quite careful. I did quite a bit of consulting with uh, one of the very large pharma giants. Um, you know, in a sprinkler capacity, I was like in there, um, and they became a sprinkler customer. And what was really interesting, I was doing actually a mass one-to-one -one presentation, not dissimilar from this one, a slightly earlier version of it. And they were all excited, but they said, ah, no one will ever let, this, let us do this. And I said, really? Are you sure? And so we had, a, we had a meeting and I did a presentation with a bunch of examples and they actually invited their lawyers. It was like the most, I don't know how to, it was a super intimidating presentation because the whole front row of this conference room was just lawyers and they're like pharma lawyers, right? And they're all dressed in suits with ties and stuff. And I'm running around in my chucks, you know, and, and, uh, and what they would do is the, and the, the, the marketing leader would stop me every like two minutes because I would show an example and talk about how it worked. And she would stop me. She'd go, okay, thanks. Thanks, God. Hold on a second. And then she turned to the lawyers. She'd go, could we do that? And they're like, yeah, we could do that. She'd go, okay. Keep going, God. And then I'd do another issue. Could we do that? And they're like, yeah, you can do that. And obviously they kept saying yes. And the reason why they kept saying yes is that the beauty of this mass one-to-one -one stuff in pharma is it's not making any claims. And I think the thing that we've lost, and this is again a mindset issue, is we've lost this. I don't know why marketers are so afraid just to like make people like them. Like you, you don't have to always be selling stuff to people. Like you can just like, can we just like have a conversation and just like make, make someone smile, make someone, make someone feel good about themselves, make someone's day. Like you, and then that will return to you. And we, I think, again, this is a, I think an obsession with measurement, but we're by over obsessing on the measurement, we're actually under delivering on brand and we're not connecting with people the way we can. And you'll eventually be able to measure it, but just maybe just, 
say something nice about the fact that they're, you know, having a baby or something like that. You don't have to like, and buy my product is not necessary. And so I actually think pharma has a huge opportunity here because it's so restricted because of the claim based nature of what it does that it would actually be, I think it'd be very refreshing to watch a pharma ad or see pharma communications that weren't full of disclaimers and all the different ways I'm going to die from using their product. <laughs> exactly. It's the worst advertising ever, right? It's like, here's this great product that, you know, you, you can dance on the, they're always dancing on the beach, right? Like you're dancing on the beach with this product. And meanwhile, announcers going, and this can happen 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 and this can happen. It's like, it's like two ads. It is the weirdest. It is the weirdest advertising. So I think you know, farm would get a lot, go a lot further if they could be. I think they could be less claim obsessed. I love it. So we really are out of time, but maybe one quick rapid fire question here at the end. Do you have okay. a book, a favorite book that you would recommend? The Man Who Sold America. It's a story of Albert Lasker. It is the story of the beginning of why creative started becoming important in advertising. If you haven't read it, you should read it. If you don't want to read it, you should get out of marketing. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Grad, for an amazing presentation today. And thanks again to Sprinkler for sponsoring our webinar. Um, as a quick FYI to everyone here, as you exit Zoom, there's going to be a window that pops up with a very short 30 second survey. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's session. Thanks so much for joining today, and we'll see you again soon. And that's a wrap on the Marketing Profs webinar and today's rerun. I want to thank Valerie Witt for being a great host. Uh, I also love the questions I was getting from the audience. It's a really, really fun webinar to do. I'd do it again in a second. And hopefully you learned something about Mass One to One and particularly about how to do life stage marketing. I, I'm really, um, what's the right word? I'm curious on who's going to really light the candle on this stuff. And if you are doing life stage marketing, using the data coming off these modern channels could you send me a note like just dm me on twitter and say hey grad i'm doing some pretty cool stuff with life stage marketing and getting some great results um, i'd love to have you on the show i'd love to talk about it i'd love to profile you this is the next frontier for marketers today and we've all got to get on it so life stage marketing moments marketing that's where it's at and summer reruns is where the unified cxm experience is at right now uh, I am your host, Grad Khan, CXO at Sprinkler, and I'll see you in a rerun next time.